So European chafer adults look like small June beetles, like about half the size of a June beetle, a brown. Um, they are from Europe, as, as the name implies. And uh, they have come into, the, into uh, Michigan in the last maybe 20 years, and they will feed on wheat. They will essentially use wheat as a lawn. So if you have damage to your lawn, if you're in an area of, uh, of sandier soil and you see damage in your lawn, it could be Japanese beetle grubs, it could be European chafer grubs. But European chafer is the one grub that will go into wheat in, in the fall and uh, destroy wheat stands. It's been a number of years since we've seen this problem, but when we did have it in the early 2000s, we had entire wheat fields eaten by November. Uh, chafers are much more cold tolerant than Japanese beetle, and they will feed up under that plant uh, even until October and early November. Uh, and we do have a good threshold for chafers now that was developed by Michigan State and some cooperators in Ontario, and it's two per square foot. So if you had a wheat field that was destroyed in the fall and you wanted to know, uh, or, or, you, or you were going to plant a field and you suspect that there's European chafer in it, if there's more than two per square foot, that would not be a field that you'd want to put wheat into. And if you had a field in the spring that you were scouting and, and, uh, and wanted to know what, if you needed to uh, essentially abandon that field and plant something else, if you have two, two per square foot, uh, that, that would be uh, bad because there that would just be too too many grubs. Uh, the seed treatments that, that you have in wheat do not uh, attack or do not uh, kill grubs. There's just not enough seed treatment on, on each seed and they just eat, eat right through it. Um, chafers kind of come and go. I know that the adults are emerging right now, but we haven't had any wheat damage in a, in a number of years. So it's just one of these things that if you, if you have a wheat field and it doesn't look right in the fall and you remember that back in uh, May, there were all these beetles flying around. It could be something like European chafer, and that, and that would be easy to tell by digging up the grubs and looking at them. Uh, the next pest is cereal aphids. We get cereal aphids that move on to wheat in the fall. They're a much larger problem if you go further south. So if you were in Kentucky south, then you worry about fall infestations that can actually last through the winter and transmit viruses like barley yellow dwarf. But in Michigan, we get some fall colonization and then we have winter and all the aphids die and then we have to get recolonized in the spring and sometimes you get uh, good colonization from south to north and sometimes you don't get many aphids but regardless aphids are just not really a problem in Michigan in wheat. I've seen aphids in wheat bad enough where the plants were all sticky and the heads were covered with aphids and that was in North Dakota many many years ago but I've never seen that in Michigan. Uh, I call aphids the, the, the chickens of the insect world because everybody eats them. So when you do have aphids in wheat, those, those lower numbers that are feeding, on, feeding down in the head, that's where you get ladybugs and other beneficial insects will come into wheat early, build their populations, then when you harvest wheat, those beneficials go into your cornfield, go into soybean, go into vegetable crops, and take care of insects then. So wheat is actually a place where predators get built up to then move into other crops. Um, so the bottom line with aphids in Michigan, pretty much they're controlled with biological control and uh, with fungus that will kill them. So when you do use a fungicide, you can actually disrupt some of the fungi that kill aphids. And when you use an insecticide, you can disrupt uh, some of the insects that actually eat aphids. We've never seen that as a problem with increased aphid numbers, but just realize that when you target something else like armyworm, you do uh, ding back some of the, uh, so, some of the predators that, that might be out there. So armyworm would be the next pest. It also cannot overwinter, so it has to be essentially carried up here from south to north in the spring. So our populations first depend on bigger populations that started down south, and then on those populations actually beginning to move up here. So armyworm can be really patchy. There are some years, very rare years, where you have everybody gets armyworm, every, everybody's infested. But usually it's more of one county here, one township there, where they, there's a storm front and they were kind of blown in and kind of rained out and in, in, into wheat or into the weedy cornfield down, down the road. Um, I was not aware of any armyworm over threshold, but then the last group, 
There was people scouting in Gratiot County and said that they had fields with, with, with head clipping that, that they had sprayed like in the last week or two. So there appears to be at least one area in the central part of the state where there was enough armyworm to do something about. So unfortunately for armyworm, during the day when they're bigger, they're on the ground. Uh, so if you're seeing them up on the plant, that tells you there's probably a bigger, a bigger infestation. So to find them, you kind of have to walk through, look for, that, uh, for leaf feeding kind of early on, and then look at the base of the plant and try to find the uh, larvae. The other thing that they do is they have, for lack of a better word, giant poop pellets. And uh, they're very distinctive. They have a distinctive shape. You're laughing like you know. Have you seen these? Yes, you have. And they're very distinctive. They look almost like giant fertilizer pellets or something. And uh, they don't seem to be very efficient when they eat the wheat. I don't know. So if you see that and then you begin to notice larvae, it's two per square foot. So it's, it's hard to judge two per square foot. So I do have some pictures in a, in a, in a bulletin that kind of show arrows showing here's two per square foot. But if you can part a row like this and you're seeing two down there and two and two and two, and there's actually leaf feeding, you want to protect that, that flag leaf eventually, that would be a sprayable population. Now, armyworms also get eaten by a lot of things. There's, when they're small, there's lots of predators out there that will attack them. They're, they're a nice juicy meal. Uh, there, are, there are parasitoids, wasps, that will attack them, and they also have uh, fungi and viruses that attack caterpillars. So if you see a caterpillar dripping off the plant, that's been killed by a, by a virus. If you see a kind of a fuzzy caterpillar, that's been killed by uh, bacteria or, or by a uh, fungus. And, and when, so if you are gonna scout, you kind of can note how much of the population looks sick because uh, sometimes you get a large percentage of the population where you got free biological control and you don't need to treat. If you do need to treat, uh, pretty much any pyrethroid would be pretty good. They will crawl up and down the plant and crawl over that residue and essentially kill themselves by exposing themselves to residue. But once you get to a worm that's about an inch and a quarter, those are too big to spray. You're essentially, they're, they're gonna pupate soon, they don't die as well, and uh, that's kind of, that's probably too, too late for anything to, to actually happen. When you do spray again, remember that when you put that insecticide on, you killed the army worms, but you're probably killing the ladybugs and some of the other things out there that, that were beneficial. That's just what happens when you spray any of these pyrethroids, they're gonna kill essentially everything else out there. It's just what happens. What else about army worm? Blah, 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 blah. No, I'm done, okay. And then last is cereal leaf beetle. Uh, when I got here, I knew that cereal leaf beetle was a very famous story. So cereal leaf beetle was introduced into the United States in the late 50s, early 60s, was first found in Berrien County, Michigan. I don't know what's special about Berrien County, Michigan, but that's where it was first found. And there was a huge biological control program uh, by the federal government and with Michigan State University to go overseas find beneficial insects and bring them back. And there was a big biocontrol bio lab in Niles, Michigan that closed not, not too long ago where all of the parasitoids against this insect were, were uh, reared. And those were spread all around Michigan in the 60s and then all around the, the United States where, where this pest had, had moved. And it's one of the biggest success stories in biocontrol. So when I got here, I didn't see cereal leaf beetle for a, for a few years until Probably eight or 10 years ago, I got a call from Montcalm County. It was a, an Amish farm that had rye, it wasn't wheat, and the field was white. So when you get cereal leaf beetle feeding, the feeding will end up typically up on the flag leaf. And this is very light feeding, but you can pass this around and look at it. It's a scraping damage. There's some here, and I got some more. So these insects, the, the larvae will start out small and they're kind of scraping with their mouth parts. They're taking just one layer off of the, off of the plant tissue and, and, and as they get bigger, they can scrape more and more. So this is probably uh, one larvae scraping for a few days if it's, if it's uh, big enough. But if it gets bad enough, every flag leaf will be scraped so that there's nothing left. So if you can imagine, the field will look fr like it's frosted, it'll, it'll look white. And I have seen that in, in, uh, in rye. 
and now in the last few years, we're starting to pick more and more of this up in, in wheat. It was not hard to find leaves like this out, out here. I'm not worried about the field, but it, it was pretty easy to walk through and here's leaves here and here and here and find those, those kind of leaves. And if you talk to Martin and some of the other people and some of the extension agents, they are seeing increasing levels of this. So uh, I do have larvae. You can, oh, they're, they're kind of tucked in here. You can maybe open that up. The larvae are gross because they look like a Colorado potato beetle, like a hunchback little larva, but instead of being nice and clean, they're, they've got all this wet stuff all over them, like it's been spit on, but it hasn't been spit on. They've covered themselves in their own excrement. So if you were a ladybug, you would not want to eat that. Uh, so when you walk through a heavily infested field, it's like walking through a spittle bug infestation in alfalfa. Your plants get, your, your pants get, get, get kind of wet, except if, you, if this was, uh, was full of cereal leaf beetle, your pants would be essentially full of insect excrement. And they live in that very happily until they pupate. So I've noticed on these leaves, there's very few larvae left. I think they've, most of them have dropped to the soil surface and they're pupating now. And there's even a few leaves where I saw like their big excrement ball was still there and the, the larva is, is gone. So once they get big enough, I'm guessing there's not a lot of things that want to eat that. So uh, uh, one larva can do a lot of damage onto a flag leaf. So what's happened over the last few years, we've had uh, growing numbers of fungicide applications on wheat. It's more and more common to spray wheat with at least one fungicide application uh, for yield. And it's really uh, easy and really tempting to throw the $3, name the pyrethroid generic something or other, into the tank just in case. But when you do that, you disrupt biological control. So probably, in my mind, the, the side uh, thing that, it, that is starting to happen from increasing our insecticide applications when they're not necessarily needed is a decrease in biological control for cereal leaf beetle, which was free and has been out there for 40 or 50 years. So it wouldn't be a surprise to me. In the last group, uh, a person said that, that last year they had a field uh, that was that was all wet he and the, the harvesting equipment was all wet and that you know was covered with all this and now he knows it's insect poop so now he's really a, you know not very happy about it but I think we're going to see an increase in that kind of problem over the next few years if people are continuing to spray with fungicide and then put it in a two dollar insecticide in there at the same time it's just that's what happens when you disrupt biological biological control so there are a whole bunch of parasitoids that were released. Parasitoids will, will attack, the, if you get good biological control, you bring in parasitoids that'll attack the egg, and then you bring something that attacks the larva, and usually you don't have an, uh, an adult parasitoid. But there's a number of parasitoids out there, and parasitoids are, they're, they're little wasps. They're very easily killed by pyrethroid. So whether it's sprayed on them or they crawl on the leaf and they, they get it on them, it's really easy to disrupt that. And remember, wheat is where your biocontrol is often starting for the rest of the year to go into soybean and kill soybean aphids and get rid of other things like western bean cutworms. So wheat is kind of your biocontrol bank that you're banking on uh, to provide biocontrol for the rest of the year.